Hi everyone, welcome back to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. This is Season 3, Episode 8, and today's guest is Andrew Hallam. Andrew is the international best-selling author of Balance, How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health and Wealth, Millionaire Teacher, The Nine Rules of Wealth You Should Have Learned in School, and Millionaire Expat, How to Build Wealth Living Overseas. Profiled on such media CNBC, the Wall Street Journal, he's also the first person to have a number one selling finance book on Amazon USA, Amazon Canada and Amazon UAE. He's written columns for the Globe and Mail, Canadian Business, Money Sense, Swiss Quote and Asset Builder. Since 2016, he has spoken at businesses and international schools in over 30 different countries. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Hey everyone, buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit EFLmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. And I'm delighted today to have Andrew Hallam. And Andrew is an international school teacher, author, and public speaker. Good morning. Good evening from this side of the world. How are you? Yeah, very good. And, and where are you today? Are you in Canada? I am in the country of Panama. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Okay, we'll we'll talk about that for its uh, tax advantages. No, for its weather, actually. I'm oh. here for the way. It's great. This place is great. <laughs> yeah. I've 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 heard the stories. I, I've watched the uh, TV show Narcos. I think there's uh, it was a nice hangout for the uh, Medellin cartel. Is that right? Back in the day, <laughs> uh, was it? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know that. So that would have been a Colombian cartel that would have hung out in Panama. Yeah, I, I yeah, think so. I, yeah, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> it's Latin America. Anything can go at any given time, right? I, exactly. So well, well, you tell me. I haven't been, but uh, you're originally from Canada. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So mm. I, I I was born in the UK and raised in Canada. So I taught at a public school there. I taught uh, high school English. And then I took a, a year off. It was a deferred salary leave. So my school district was offering these packages where you could have a year off with, with uh, you could have a year off. And, and essentially, it was like a year off with full pay, but it, it, it was what it was really was that the school district would take a portion of our salary for the time leading up to that. And then they would essentially give it back to us on a monthly basis during the year off. And so I traveled for a year. And then instead of coming back to Canada to take, to take that job back, I ended up in Singapore at Singapore American School. So I taught high school English and then eventually high school personal finance there until 2014. And then that year, my wife and I thought we would take one year off just as a bit of a break, a sabbatical, one year led to two, which I guess has led to going on eight. And uh, yeah, right now we're in uh, in Panama City. Okay, and uh, I, I think it, it, there's a few things actually uh, we, we have in common. I think one is uh, I, I, back in the day, maybe 10, 12 years ago, what was the number, maybe 13 years ago, also got a what we call a sabbatical career break and uh, never went back uh, and never looked back either. But uh, and and also the second thing is uh, I think your father was a mechanic. Is that right? That's correct. That's mine, what he, uh, mine too. Yeah. So there you go. So we have yeah. we have that. Um, so tell me about um, so from one of your books. So I um, Andrew. I, I think on the on the Kindle store, Barnes and Noble, and all the good bookshops. Um, I just mentioned some of uh, Andrew's books, and uh, please uh, feel free to add more, uh, Andrew. Uh, Balance: How to Invest and Spend for Happiness. Uh, Millionaire Expat: 
how to build wealth living overseas and teacher the nine rules of wealth you should have is that right nine rules of wealth you should have learned in school so that book was uh -huh. was called millionaire teacher i did two editions of that one was in 2011 that was the first edition and and i was really really lucky as it turned out that book uh, hit number one on amazon for all money and business related categories wow. which was phenomenal um it did the same in canada so that was pretty exciting uh, and i wrote a second edition of that in 2017 and you know there were people who had read those books who lived abroad who asked me what well, how do i actually do this or how do i invest like this if i'm british and i live in cairo so uh, on my website, I would explain to people what that process would be. And then eventually, I ended up writing uh, some books for expats. And so the, the third edition of that just came out about three weeks ago. It's, uh, it's called Millionaire Expat, How to Build Wealth Living Overseas. So it explains how people can build low-cost portfolios of what's called index funds or ETFs. And the final four chapters go into low cost places that expats could consider retiring if they uh, if they choose. So we're looking at places like Mexico, uh, Panama, where I am now, Thailand, Malaysia, um, Eastern Europe, Portugal, that sort of thing. So it was fun to profile people who lived in those regions, asking them questions about the medical and the cost of living and what their overall experiences were, the safety, the the uh, the weather. Yeah, the weather is an important one because you mentioned a lot of sunny countries there and uh, me coming from Ireland and you you from Canada, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people and, and the States too, they dream of retiring, you know, to Florida in the States, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I think in Ireland, maybe it's uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, I think is the mm. maybe good for arthritis, maybe the damp weather yeah. doesn't help. Yeah, it's also really low cost. So, you know, it's, it's fabulous in that, you know, in it, just uh, a few weeks ago as well, it seems like I published two books in one month. And I guess I really did. The official launch date was the same. And in 2020, I had quite a bit of time on my hands. So I worked on two books concurrently. Um, one was that uh, the Millionaire Expat third edition. And the other one, as you mentioned, Philip, was that book called Balance. And, and this is where one of the things I actually looked at was research on retiring early. It, it's one of those things where you know, people often aspire to retire. But ironically, uh, when we do that often, not, not in every case, but often people lose a sense of purpose. And they also end up uh, on aggregate uh, dying earlier, which is fascinating because, you know, we aspire to do this. So many of us aspire to, to quit what we're doing early, whereas the, you know, the brain is much like a muscle. We either use it or we lose it. We start to literally shut down when we don't use it. And there's the socialization aspect of continuing to work as well. So in the book, Balance, I didn't recommend people work until they're 90 at some job that they hate. But to dial back, find something that they enjoy doing at some stage, uh, if it isn't the job that they're doing now, find something else that they could do potentially part-time for as long as they can. It does alleviate a lot of the financial stresses associated with retirement, knowing that you're going to be getting some income during your retirement years. And also, uh, research suggests it makes us happier, gives us that sense of purpose, and increases our longevity. It, it reminds me of when I first moved to Japan, and uh, I think it was teaching a conversation class. And one of the questions was, what do you want to do when you retire? And uh, the students looked at each other and said, retire? You know, that's... Uh... Japanese people don't retire. Um, so I, I don't know in Canada, but uh, I think, uh, you know, when I was, um, when my own father was retiring, actually, nearly 20 years ago now, was 65, it, it was exactly like that. He, he seemed to lose a sense of purpose for, you know, about six months, a year. And uh, he even wanted to stay on for another year with his company. But uh, they said, no, mandatory, mandatory retirement, so you have to leave. Um, is that your experience and from your research and from people you know who've retired? Yeah, it's um, not so much my anecdotal experience mm. or my anecdotal research, but in, in reading uh, in the uh, articles in the Journal of Epidemiology, and the European Journal of Epidemiology, the, the research on it is fairly robust. 
things like, uh, although we can't control things like, oh, there's a genetic component to how long we're going to live. We can't necessarily control whether we get Alzheimer's or whether we get dementia. But uh, if we continue to work, the odds are that we end up warding some of those things off. And so we end up uh, fortifying ourselves to a point against uh, sort of cognitive deterioration. So it's fascinating to see this because, and also feel fascinating about what you said with respect to Japanese students, you know, when you ask them about retirement, because in Japan, uh, they have more than 1600 silver haired centers. And these silver haired centers are places where people, perhaps there's a, a person who works full time as a lawyer or as a, an accountant, and they don't want to do that any longer. So they sort of retire, but not. They go into a bit of part-time work. They, they, they go to a, a silver-haired center that assigns them positions that they can choose to do. And so ironically, you know, you might find someone sweeping leaves in a park in Japan who is a multi-multi-millionaire and you would never know it because they typically keep moving. They keep doing things. And it's one of the reasons, theoretically, that the Japanese live much longer than, say, North Americans do. Yeah, and uh, maybe diet as well as uh, something got to do with it. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that, that's true. And w when you look at the most long-lived people in the world, I think is uh, you'll you'll be able to correct me here on this. But I think Sardinia, which I've actually went to on my honeymoon, is uh, mm -hmm. Okinawa, yes. and some parts of Mexico as well. Is that right? Central America. Uh, you've got two out of three, and you're right yeah. with the Central America part. So it's mm. actually the 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 peninsula, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. Gotcha. Okay. I was thinking so you got Yucatan, it. You really got but, it. <laughs> you know, there, but that, you know, that didn't do so good for the uh, dinosaurs. But um, so, it, so tell me, uh, they, they, I remember watching, I think it was a episode of Oprah, maybe 20, 30 years, I, I can't remember, but maybe 25 years ago. And they put it down to one was uh, religion. I think uh, in certain parts of the, the US, Seventh-day Adventists, is that right? They have, they're quite, uh, have long lifespan compared to other communities. Yeah, that's pretty interesting because mm. I think what they do is they, they continue to be active in their environment. They continue to be active in their communities and in their churches. And so they keep doing things. It's a, mm. the idea of retirement is actually a fairly new concept uh, and is not necessarily a super healthy concept. Yes, we are living longer because of uh, you know, we've learned a lot about nutrition. We've got medical science in our, in our back pocket now that we wouldn't have had 100 years ago. But we, in theory, could live even longer if we instead thought about perhaps not having absolute retirement or we do nothing. But doing something like what they do in Japan. So I have a friend who's a, uh, a multi, multi-millionaire, and he's been financially independent for, for several years, as you can imagine. He sold a business that ended up, uh, ended up getting a fortune for it. And for him, what he, what he plans to do is he plans to build wheels in a bike shop. And he says that would be the, the most fun in the world for him. He can talk to people as they come into the bike shop. He, uh, he can build high-end bicycle wheels. They can pay him whatever they want because he doesn't need the money. Uh, and he gets to feel like he's getting up in the morning for some kind of purpose. He gets to engage with people, continue to learn through the process. And uh, yeah, he, en he, en he enjoys that. And it's the social aspect, isn't it? I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists, yes. they're a yes. you know, congregation. I think it was it uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about in, was it in Outliers? He talks about the... You know, story about the Italian community in upstate New York, and they mm. all ate like bacon and very high cholesterol, <laughs> high fat, wow. uh, high salt food, but they outlived everybody else. Yeah, really yeah. good memory. You have a really yeah. good memory on that. That that was uh, that's a place called uh, Rosetto. It's actually in Pennsylvania. And oh, okay. They came, but yeah, you've nailed it. They came over from Italy, and they had a lot of the old Italian customs where multi generations were in the same home. They had really a, an open door policy. The nucleus of the town was very tight. So it was built more like an older European town than it was a typical American town where people were spread out. And it was a medical marvel. So 
uh, scientists sort of descended on Rosetto to, to ask, well, why is it these people live so long? Their water quality is the same as neighboring towns. They don't particularly eat all that well. A lot of them smoke. Uh, but things like uh, heart disease were virtually unheard of. And what the scientists found was that uh, Rosetta was, as you mentioned there, Philip, uh, freakishly social. You know, children are always in and out of each other's homes. Families are cooking with other families. It's just one big family in a sense. And then what ended up happening was when some of the younger generation in the 19, late 1970s and the early 1980s got a taste of the American dream. Uh, and they wanted to buy bigger houses that were away from the community and they wanted to have better cars. They, uh, they did that and it broke up the social fabric. What's fascinating is that in Rosetto, if you actually had the money for a bigger house or for a fancier car, it was considered poor taste to actually purchase these things. So, you know, you'd be kind of rubbing it in the faces of your neighbors. So they kept their wealth, those who had it, pretty low key. And uh, it's fascinating, Dan Bootner did some other studies extending on this, or at least researched several studies um, that he compiled in a book called The Blue Zones. And you mentioned the, you know, we talked about the Nicoya Peninsula, uh, Sardinia, Okinawa, Japan, these regions where people live a freakishly long time, and they all have different customs and they eat differently and they exercise different levels. Uh, but the thing that they have in common is that uh, that really strong social fabric. Yeah, the really strong social fabric in Okinawa, n not so much in, in Tokyo. I think uh, a lot of yeah. people don't know their neighbors. And uh, it's any know. big city, yeah, right? It's exactly. Any, any big city is like that. Yeah, you find that uh, in the country, people tend to be far more friendly um, yeah. and social than they are in cities. That's true. So coming on to that, another thing they mentioned i think in this tv opera tv show was actually thigh you know your actual thigh muscles and they said the people who do a lot of squatting close to the ground and they followed some uh farmers in sardinia maybe with a, a scythe or a, a sickle and they were like clearing away the weeds while uh, <laughs> squatting and of course you know if you come to japan you know what uh, People like living close to the ground and squatting. Yeah. And, uh, they're very yeah. comfortable with it. And they say that, uh, you know, for older people, that's, uh, you know, once they lose the function of, you know, of being able to walk or even yeah. walk distances, uh, you know, the quality of life disimproves and then has the knock on effect, isn't it? You know, you can't meet your friends and, you know, enjoy life, basically. That's it. Yeah. Mm. It's one, one of the things that really starts to deteriorate among older people is the level of flexibility and a range of motion. And if you look at the Japanese and how they squat and how they'll sit, um, they'll sit in ways where you'll often look, we'll look at them and think, how, how are they flexibly, comfortably sitting like that, perhaps like on a floor or a little cushion with their legs like that. Uh, and if you look at a Tai Chi master, you know, they work on range of motion and you can look at a really old Tai Chi master and when they walk, they have really good strong posture and they walk like a much younger person but you take uh, even like a marathon runner who's in their 70s it's an extraordinary thing but you take a typical brit or a canadian marathon runner is in their 70s and they'll still walk like they're old you know they're still they, they lack that flexibility although they have strong cardiovascular development like you say there's that that squatting component and that flexibility is huge for uh is huge for range of motion and continued mobility as we age and one thing, a thing I did notice, Andrew, is you, you look uh, radiant. Uh, you're obviously a person who takes care of himself physically. So what kind of regime do you have? I When I spoke to uh, uh, Dave Sperling a few weeks, well, a few months ago now, he was uh, big into the Wim Hof method. And, you know, of course, in, in the last few years, people have talked about intermittent fasting, uh, low carb diets. Um, what what do you recommend? Uh, what works for you? <laughs> for me, um, so essentially anything that can convert to sugars or sugars themselves uh, are bad. I mean, things like uh, the cancer, for example, loves sugar, and things that convert to sugar. So carbohydrates converts to sugar. So it's best that we have or at least limit the the amount of carbohydrates that we have. And then uh, a lot of green leafy vegetables. It's interesting you're asking me this because no one's ever asked me this on a podcast. They usually ask me the finance related questions, but I like it. 
I like it. And, I, and one of the reasons too, is that in the book Balance that I wrote, I do talk about health as one of the four pillars of success, but I don't get into these sorts of specifics. So I eat a lot of uh, green leafy vegetables and uh, I'm, uh, I might be a bit of an extreme case. So you've asked a bit of an extreme case here. I, and again, there are things in life that we can and things in life that we cannot control. Uh, for me, I ended up getting cancer in 2009 and I was, I was healthy. I was very healthy. Uh, when I guess three months before I was diagnosed, I ended up uh, winning a running race in Singapore against 15,000 other people. So physically I was, but I ended up through a routine scan found that I had bone cancer in my, uh, in my spinal area and in my, in three of my ribs. And so you know, knock on wood, I'm, I'm, I'm fine today. I had successful surgery. And what I did was I read everything that I could on healthy nutrition to look at what is it that cancer doesn't like. My diet was already really good, so I didn't have to change too much. But, uh, but when I found out that cancer really likes sugar uh, and so many other ailments do as well, I've cut sugar uh, entirely from my diet. So I won't... Uh, I won't eat uh, a chocolate cake, for example, or pie. And, and it sounds like I'm depriving myself of it. But what, what's really strange is that when you don't eat things like that, like a, a chocolate bar, like a normal chocolate bar, I'll have chocolate bar with 90% cacao. But if I were to try to eat a regular chocolate bar, which probably has, I don't know, 25% cacao, uh, it would be so sweet, it would make me feel ill. And I'd be the same with ice cream. Like if I were to actually have a little bit of ice cream now, used to love it, I'd, I'd really enjoy it. But, uh, but you can do these things, wean yourself off some of these sugars and you're not depriving yourself through that process because it gets to a point where you just really wouldn't enjoy it. I suppose if you force fed it to me, uh, you know, o over time, I would probably start to enjoy it again, but I'm really, in a, I'm really in a good place knowing that no one's going to do that to me. <laughs> Reminds me of a Simpsons episode where Homer goes to hell and they start feeding him, force feeding him donuts, and you know it's <laughs> it, it's more like heaven for him. But um, so m moving on, it's it's really fascinating. Yeah, as I said, we I I had from the outset and from in my little preparation that I did, we mentioned before the podcast that uh, uh, you know I said oh. You know, I have to ask all these finance questions. It's it's a bit daunting for me. So, so let's talk. Uh, move on a little bit to uh, to finance. And you touch. Are you on sure? The... Are you sure? Are you sure? Oh, I know we're we're I'm enjoying like, this one so much. But, I'm like, I'm but we yeah. can talk about professional professional tennis too. I love talking about professional tennis. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I know almost zero about tennis. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not on. Uh, I'm not a good ground there, but uh, yeah. So we talk about uh, you mentioned a couple of things, and actually at the beginning of your book, the millionaire teacher, you talk about you tell the story of moving to Singapore, and the uh, what was it? The mother of one of your students was uh, mm. paid you by check, but the yeah, the check yeah. never came through. But she had a a luxuri luxurious apartment and Rolex and um, I don't know Mercedes BMW. Maybach, yeah. whoever. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and the point you were trying to make with, with that story. Well, the, the basis for that is that uh, people with high salaries aren't necessarily well off. And uh, often people with high salaries like to spend more, uh, show off what they have. Uh, I didn't mention this in the book Millionaire Teacher, but I did in the book Balance where I extended on that and found that people who buy material acquisitions or love material high status acquisitions don't tend to be as happy or as fulfilled because these things are like sugar fixes. You know, like you, you have uh, you buy a brand new car, a high end car, and it's exciting for a little while, a couple of weeks, but sooner than later, it's just another car. The, the interesting thing is that, you know, we don't actually end up increasing our life satisfaction by buying these material things and they impede our levels of wealth. So, you never really know who has what by looking at what they own. And this couple, this family was a case in point. Now they drove a, a Jag, which in Singapore is ludicrously expensive. So I think uh, at the time, it's probably about $300,000 to have a Jag in Singapore. Even a, you know, a Honda Civic at the time would have been about $150,000. It was just, uh, or close, maybe $120,000. It's just ridiculous because of something that they, they 
they call a, a COE, a certificate of entitlement. It's like, you know, think of it as an extra tax that you pay when you purchase a vehicle or when you when you put it on the road. So yeah, my point there was that it's it's important not to get carried away purchasing too many uh, material acquisitions that depreciate and trying to invest our money for the future. And in doing so, we can end up building earlier financial independence. And we don't really deprive ourselves of anything by not always buying the latest iPhone and not buying a fancy purse, even if we have the money. Actually putting that money aside is smarter investing it and or spending it on experiences, which I talked about in the book Balance, and experiences do enhance life satisfaction because they help you build memories, especially when you are enjoying those experiences with people you love. Uh, and there's another element too, where when you do have a little bit of money, it doesn't have to be a lot, but using it to help other people, to empower other people, um, increases our life satisfaction far, far more so uh, than spending it on material acquisitions. Not only does it increase our life satisfaction, but it also increases our levels of health, strength, and longevity. And it's getting back to the Rosetta example as well, isn't it? It, it sure is, because that's exactly it. You know, we're we are we are designed to help each other. We that's how we evolved. It's how we survived. And and it is really interesting. And in that now that socioeconomically we've come to a point, in most societies, first world societies, where we can be very independent. But this independence comes at a cost because we are designed to be literally, we've evolved to assist one another and we get a lot out of that. Yes, exactly. So that's uh, so get, getting on to the, the next part I wanted to talk about was uh, affluenza. I remember maybe before the financial crash in 2007, 2008, you may be aware of this documentary, are you? I think it was about mid 2000s, maybe early 2000s and uh, mm. this was kind of the the malaise in the western world wasn't it there was uh, an abundance of credit and uh, people mm. were splurging here and there and uh, i remember watching a tv program probably oprah as well i think but at, at the time they were talking about she is a lot of uh, what was a financial management gurus doesn't she Susie mm. orman and all these people and um they, it, it was quite normal to talk about balancing 20 credit cards. I remember watching an episode <laughs> and they were saying, how can I balance my 20 credit cards? And, uh, uh, you know, I remember thinking at the time, is, uh, you know, am I insane here? Why does uh, anybody need 20 credit cards? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Do you remember it's those funny. heady days? Yeah. yeah, those heady days are back. Yeah. I think those heady days are back. Where, uh, and, and not only with, uh, with spending. Uh, but also with investing. I mean, these days you can buy any kind of harebrained scheme and it seems to be making bucket loads of money until it won't. And so it's something that every generation ends up falling into in terms of a trap. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I, I could talk at, at length about that working in a, a business newspaper and the, what they call the Lehman shock here in Japan, the financial crisis mm. and, and uh, property collapse in Ireland and uh, taxi drivers buying like eight properties in Bulgaria and people paying by credit card and, you know, for uh, and the, you know, the price of houses go, uh, increasing by two, three thousand per per week, for example. So, um, yeah, good and bad times. But um, mm. so when you talk about saving money and be you're not preaching the austerity gospel that a lot of people say, you know, you shouldn't buy the latte and you shouldn't treat yourself to this. Uh, so it, it's more like the Mr. Micawber, is it? It's about, you know, at the end of the day, you have to you have to save before you spend. And, you know, if you're it in is. surplus, you're happy. It, yeah, it is. And, you know, when I look at the book, when I look at the book balance, um, when I look at spending money on something like the latte factor. And so the idea here is that, you know, uh, I think it was David Bach in the automatic millionaire who popularized this idea that if you save money on lattes, that money, if, if invested over time, could actually end up making you a millionaire over a working career. And he's right. He's absolutely right. What I did was I, I differentiated that latte in the book, in the book balance, because I said that if you're buying that expensive latte on the run, so you're purchasing 
watching it and you're drinking it while you're driving to work. That is a complete waste of money. You might as well just make some coffee at home, put it in a service thermos and take it with you because although it's maybe a higher quality cup of coffee, you can't enjoy it while your mind is on the road, you're thinking about getting to work, you're not actually sitting and enjoying it with friends. However, if you go to a cafe, and this is different, with some friends, having a latte then. So I'm not all about being uber frugal with in every capacity. I'm about trying to figure out, as I wrote in the book Balance, what are the things that actually enhance life satisfaction based on research? And so what are the things that we could spend money on that do? And what are the things that we often spend money on that don't enhance life satisfaction and where that money could be used towards something like debt reduction, personal debt reduction, which does increase levels of life satisfaction. Debts actually bum us out. Um, and then, of course, having money to put towards investments for the future or giving. Yeah, the, the latte, uh, it, it reminds me of a meme or a gif, gif, whatever you call them, uh, about the, the beer drinker and, and his wife or significant other where he's uh you know he drinks beer every night and uh, she says uh you know you drink two cans of beer every night if you multiply that by seven and then by you know 52 and over these years you would have you know saved thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars and uh he says uh you don't drink beer and she said no so where's your thirty thousand dollars yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That's that's it, isn't it? You know, we can talk about the latte, but uh, it's it's about yeah. the investment. So let's talk about approaching money. And this is something that I've talked about with guests. Uh, and is there's a shame, isn't there, around, you know, saving or even talking about money? You touch on that in one of your books, don't you? About even mm. even speaking about managing money or making money. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, in many circles, it's a it's a cultural taboo to talk about it. And for that reason, uh, we often don't share what we learn about it. And, and one thing I found that moving overseas is that there are some really unscrupulous uh, financial advisory groups that invest people's money. And the people that sell you these products make a fortune in commissions. And because there are such high fees associated with these investment products, it's really, really difficult to make money. And people are locked in often for really long periods of time. And they would have to pay massive penalties just to pull the money out. So so these are investment products that nobody should buy. Nobody should buy these things. And what I found, though, is that, you know, I would be traveling, doing a lot of talks. So I I give a lot of uh, talks on investing throughout the world in 2000. 17, I think I, in a six month period, I gave 90 talks in 13 different countries. So loads of speaking. And when I speak to predominantly, when I speak to to British people, now this is really interesting to me, um, coming from being born in the UK, my parents are British, Brits are less likely to talk about money than Americans. And so what I found was Brits were more targeted by these unscrupulous financial advisory groups. I mean, for a couple of different reasons. One, it's usually Brits selling to Brits in the first place, you know, when they're selling to them in Dubai or in Africa or Southeast Asia. Uh, But two, because people wouldn't talk about money, the people that ended up getting screwed over by these firms never talked to their friends about it. And so when I gave these talks, I said, look, we have to open up. You know, we really need to talk about these things so that we can ensure that the people that arrive in say dubai or say singapore next year new people arriving from europe that are starting their career as new expats we don't want them falling into the same horrible schemes and and if they do it's our fault not their fault because we know better now so these things that have happened to us or these things we know about we need to be able to share this information so not just about the bad things you know, but we also need to share the information about some of the good things. And there are some really good groups that have done that. There's some great Facebook groups, um, like the Simply FI groups. Uh, they're fabulous, you know, financial independence groups that talk about, at least online, sharing a lot of information about, um, about building financial independence while, while working in different cities. Okay, so uh, you mentioned... Uh... The money managers, financial advisors, we're not going to mention the uh, companies, but I'm sure if you're on LinkedIn and uh, you you get uh, 
connection requests from certain companies mm. and five people have contacted you or made connection requests in three months. Maybe this is kind of a high <laughs> pressure sales and uh, it's probably a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone that ever approaches you to ask you if you want to invest, uh, say no every time because good, <laughs> good investments don't, uh, don't find you. Right. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So uh, good investments don't find you. So um, in the book, you start, you, you also talk about, and uh, it's, it's. I mean, I, I probably read it and some of the listeners have read elsewhere about compounding mm. yeah, and compound interest. So there's a couple of schools of thought on that is one is you start off with your uh, lunch money and you save your 10 yen or 10, 10 cents or 10 pennies or whatever. And then eventually, you know, because of the length of time, it, you know, the compound interest will work in your favor. But um, I think, I don't know if you're familiar with MJ DeMarco, the millionaire, what's his name? I can't remember the name of his book now, the uh, uh, millionaire entrepreneur. But he says that actually to become an entrepreneur first, then have a nice, nice capital to put in and then use the compound interest. What? I mean, for people who are probably listening to this, they're probably not in school. They're school owners, maybe managers, people who are looking to, uh, I don't know, branch out, scale their business. Um, I don't know the demographic here, but uh, as regards compound interest, where where can people start with saving and asset allocation as well? Yeah, I've kept it really simple myself. And so for me, I mean, I didn't start a business. I just had a salary. So I didn't have a lot of income, but I had time. And so I started investing when I was young and time compounds or time can compound money quite dramatically, especially if you have a lot of it Two, knowing that you're never going to be younger than you are right now. So if you're listening to this and you're, and you're 50 and you're saying, well, you know, I'm not 19, so I don't have as much time to compound my money. Like I said, uh, starting today is the best bet because you're never going to be younger than you are today. So yeah, the idea there is to, I think it's important to track what you, what you spend and track how much money you make on some kind of app. And people could do that by pen and paper as well, but treat your household like a business. And that's, that's a key. No matter what is, no matter what it is that you do to earn money, treat your household like a business, know how much is coming in and know what's going out and know what's going out in different categories very specifically. So for my wife and for me, what we've done for years is we've tracked every penny we've made and every penny we've earned uh, or every penny we've spent. And it's really easy to do. You know, these days, we used to do it with pen and a notebook. And now we just have a, an app on our phone. So you could use Mint or Good Budget or Pocket Expense. And when we come back from the supermarket, we will just 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 uh, pack in how much money we ended up spending categorize it under groceries, press enter, um, and we end up a nice, neat pie graphs at the end of the month. But what that does is it allows us, encourages us to spend less. It's really fascinating. It's much like diets. Uh, diets don't work that well, but tracking what you eat does work really well. So just by virtue of tracking it makes you a bit more accountable. And then it frees up more money that you could potentially put into something like a diversified portfolio of ETFs which is what I have, which is what I advocated in my book. And over time, if you're diligent and you just continue to add money to that diversified portfolio of ETFs, which are represented by the global stock market um, and then a bond market component, over time, uh, you will, if you're diligent, build earlier uh, financial independence than you might ever expect to. Okay, and that might be another reason why Japanese live longer as well, because... Um... You know, uh, being married to Japanese, track all the incomes and outgoings. Mm. And uh, I mean, it's it's common to see people in the cafe with their taking photographs of the receipts. And uh, oh, I, yeah. I didn't know that. That's very yeah. good. Yeah, and my I think my wife does as well. But maybe, and you know, there's the uh, I I don't know if you're familiar with the word hesukuri, which is a Japanese word for hidden savings. That traditionally oh. the Japanese housewife would. Uh, uh, hide money because maybe mm. the uh, maybe the husband was uh, frittering it away but they would hide and traditionally in, it. <laughs> in the rice 
they would put like bundles of money uh, under the rice. Like Japanese men would never go near f- cooking food, so they, they know it'd be safe there. But so uh, what's the what's the Japanese term? What do you call the hidden money? Hesukuri. Hesukuri. Yeah. yeah. Hesukuri. Yeah. I only I only know how to say one thing in Japanese. I can tell you I was bit by a dog today. Okay. But, yeah, that was probably on Duolingo, was it? <laughs> it sounds like a Duolingo sentence. But uh, yeah, getting getting back um, to um, <laughs> to investment. Okay, and um, you talk a little bit about. Uh, so let's for listeners here, and especially for me. Uh, if you could give us a, a quick 101 on investing and uh, index funds, bonds, derivatives, uh, you know, investing in property. I, I won't go on because maybe, you know, it, it's too much. But can you give me a, a mm. quick thumbnail for people wanting to start out in investing that have really have never done it before or, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. The, so, uh, I mean, I mean, first of all, I guess I should plug the books only. Yeah, oh, because, please, yeah, and I yeah, will put oh, a a, uh, yeah. a link in and, the description and on the website as well. So there's no no problem about that, Andrew. And I say only because I just this is the best way for me to actually describe it was when I I you know put hands to keyboard to try and figure out how to describe this in the best possible way that I could. But essentially, it's with a portfolio of index funds or a portfolio of ETFs, you would own a sliver of all of the world's companies, or at least a broad representation of them. So British companies and Irish Irish companies and Canadian companies, American companies. Uh, and you can own all of this with a global stock market index. And if you actually own a global stock market index over any 10 year duration, you will outperform about 90% of professional money managers just by owning a single product. And it's really, really quite simple. And the academics behind it are irrefutable. So when you read, if you do read one of those books, either Balance or Millionaire Teacher or Millionaire Expat, you can actually see the explanation how and why this happens. Um, and it's an, like I say, it's an, it's an academically irrefutable concept. So knowing that, it's quite nice in that you could open up a brokerage account you could purchase a global stock market index, which gives you the representation or an ETF, which gives you uh, a broad sliver of virtually every single share uh, in the world, or at least a really broad representation of them. And then you can have, as your second investment, you could have a, a global bond market index, which does the same things for bonds. Bonds are really boring. You know, they're a lot like... Um, uh, they're like uh, loans that you make to a government or a corporation in exchange for a rate of interest. But with an index, they rotate on themselves. So when bond interest rates rise or bond prices drop, the index will buy a new one at the new rate because it's continually expiring bonds and picking up new ones. So it's very, very automatic. It's not something that's actively managed by any any individual. And so if you want to know how to do this, uh, there is actually a guy in the United States who will show you how to do it for, I think he charges $190 a year. He'll do a screen share concept with you. His name is Mark Zorl, and he works for a firm called Plan Vision. And he can show you exactly how to invest as I've described in, uh, in, in my three books, Millionaire Teacher, Millionaire Expat, and Balance. They can actually show you how to do it. And you can ask him as many questions as you want over that 12 month period for that $190. Okay, uh, excellent. And so for somebody, let's say, listening to this, and they're in their 40s, 50s, and they maybe have some regret that they didn't start earlier, you know, they didn't read the books, they didn't take the advice. And, uh, you know, you start where you are. Yeah, so exactly. um, what advice would you have for these people leading up to, well, maybe not retirement, you know, some kind of semi-retirement as we sure. talked about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I would say that um, the one thing to start is you'll never be younger than you are right now. So starting now is better than not starting at all. So you are going to be better off. You could be you know, 50s or 60s and you haven't invested a penny. It's better to start now because if you don't, um, I mean, you'll be better off ultimately having started than not. So I would say that. I would say to people who haven't uh, amassed much of a investment portfolio, if you don't have 
some kind of government pension coming your way. One of the really cool things is just knowing that you could, theoretically, you could retire or work part-time online and live in a low-cost country. So we can call that geographical arbitrage. So you could earn money online. Uh, it could be first world from first world sources, and you could live in a place like Mexico or Guatemala or mountains of Panama. Yes. Money uh, go further. Yeah, you could even go further. But uh, there's the other consideration, which is, uh, you know, double taxation treaties, etc. So so talk to me about that, that uh, what are um, maybe some pitfalls that people don't realize about investments as regards tax or capital gains tax or taxation treaties? I know there's a, there's a lot of countries to mention, but in general, mm -hmm. if you can give me some maybe stories and or, or yeah, well in like. yeah in general, uh, if taxes are a concern to you, you could you could spend your time or you could domicile yourself in a a low tax country and become a resident there. So if you become a resident there and you cut your uh, residential ties in what might be your home country. So let's assume that you are, you're from the UK and you choose to retire in Malaysia, you would cut your residential ties in the UK. And so the best bet is for you really not to have, uh, not to have too many ties to the country. So it's a bit tricky. So it's best that you get a, a tax accountant to talk to you about residency, but keep your money offshore and keep as few ties to the UK as possible so that you truly would be deemed a resident in another country. So you get official residency there. And if it's a country like, I'll just, I'm just using Malaysia as an example, they actually don't have a capital gains taxes in Malaysia. So the money that you end up accruing in your portfolio of ETFs uh, can be sold at any point in time. Any piece of it can be sold at any point and you wouldn't have to pay any capital gains taxes on that legally. Oh, wow. So yeah. there you go. Uh, and any other countries you can mention with no capital gains tax? Uh, there's some more expensive ones. Uh, Singapore, Luxembourg. I don't believe Hong Kong has capital gains tax, but of course it's expensive there. You have uh, places like, San like Panama, where the capital gains tax is 10%. Um, I smile a little bit because it'd be actually kind of hard to pay it. Uh, because you don't typically get like a T4 slip or something as you would from uh, an institution in Canada or an institution uh, from a UK bank. It'll actually tell you what you owe in terms of capital gains taxes. But uh, yeah, there are several countries where, uh, where there are no or low capital gains tax. Georgia is another one. So in Eastern Europe, and it's very popular among retirees because it's a uh, low cost and very, very tax friendly as a destination to, uh, to, be, to, to be residing in. So it's really popular among digital nomads as well. So these are places where you know, people can go, uh, they can work online, pay very low taxes, low cost of living, and open up brokerage accounts that don't necessarily have to be based in a country like Luxembourg it, or, uh, in, or Georgia, but uh, they could be based uh, like a, a US type brokerage, like interactive brokers. And as long as a person buys exchange traded funds that don't trade on the US market, but on the London Stock Exchange or the Canadian Stock Exchange, uh, they won't have to fear paying uh, or their heirs won't have to fear paying US estate taxes either. So that's a, that's a little bit of a, a fire hose that I just sort of toss at everybody but uh if you do contact the guy the, the guy i mentioned at plan vision and or read my book millionaire expat uh, i'll go through this process and you can learn more about it yeah and i'll put the name it's mark zorrell i took a uh yeah i took a yeah. note of it there and i'll put a link of course to the book in the description so as regards a brokerage account do you go to a traditional stock broker or do you use an app what's your idea of using apps for example i think in was it the nine rules of wealth you say mm -hmm. internet mag madness but is does this uh carry over to apps as well what what where where can people start on investing mm. well it depends on the country and where they are if you're based in the uk you can go directly through vanguard uk 
it's wonderful. There are no uh, commission fees associated with buying Vanguard's index fund. So if you're living in the UK, that's that's a fabulous option. If you're British or Canadian or American and you want to be uh, investing in a offshore account, well, I'd say Americans can't do that, but let's just say that uh, the Canadians, uh, Brits, Aussies, Kiwis, they could open an account with a firm like Swiss Quote Bank Europe or Interactive Brokers, again, as long as they're buying off uh, a non-US stock exchange. So it's a little bit more tax friendly not to have that link as far as your heirs are concerned, because the, the IRS can take a little bit of the money after you die. Actually, it can take quite a bit of the money after you die uh, and your heirs don't get as much. So there's just a, you can buy the same products at the same brokerage, but you just have to buy them a slightly different way through a slightly different door. And, and I explain all of that in the book, Millionaire Expat. And uh, yeah, another plug for Plan Vision. They can help you do that. Yeah, and uh, it's it seems uh, it's a little bit of a disadvantage to be from the US. Is, it, is that? Yeah, yeah, hmm. it can be. It can be because uh, Americans and uh, citizens of Eritrea uh, end up paying tax on worldwide income. And so like an American earning, let's say they earn a lot of money and they live in Dubai, which has uh, not only a capital gains, is not only a capital gains for your jurisdiction, but there's no income tax. And if you are, for example, yourself, Philip, if you move to Dubai, theoretically, you could earn a million dollars a year, $2 million a year and not pay any income tax on that. Whereas an American will have to pay income tax on that above uh, the foreign income exclusion, which is about $108,000 a year. Anything that they earn above that, they have to pay income tax at the highest US marginal bracket, regardless of where they live in the world, even if they live in a income tax free jurisdiction. But non-Americans and non-Eritreans, it's, 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 a, it's a lot different and it's much more beneficial. But of course, if you come from Canada, they, they can freeze your bank account. Isn't that right? If you disagree with the government, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> um, what's happening now on the 22nd of February, I, I think. But uh, um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. We we never get so political on this. Podcast, <laughs> so, um, so don't worry about it. Uh, so, OK, so that's. We talked about, uh, you know, if you haven't started investing and you're maybe in middle age, but let's say you have a, a nice little bit uh, bundle, you have some property, you have some real estate and uh, we talk about maybe uh, what we say legacy planning, maybe or, you know, semi retirement and uh, you're looking to be as tax efficient as possible. Um, can you give me some pointers there on how you would yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, if you are if you're extremely wealthy and you want to hire someone who can help you through this process, you could hire a fee-based financial advisory firm. Not a financial advisory firm that gets paid commissions to sell you products, but a firm that uh, will pay you for or you will pay for a financial plan. And I'll help you put together a financial plan. It could cost several thousand dollars, but it can uh, depending on your circumstances, be very well worth it with respect to the estate planning and uh, and the preparation of uh, proper tax planning. Okay. And asset release, is, is that the right term? Uh, it's basically selling your home and they or basically sell your home and uh, they give you the money uh, the, and then they own it after you die. Is that called asset release? Is that right? Oh, um, like a reverse mortgage. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, and some people do that because, of course, home equity values are, are through the roof. Things are so, so expensive. So, yeah, in North America, they call those reverse mortgages okay. where, you know, literally uh, you get to live in the home forever and the bank will pay you uh, basically buy that that property piece by piece by piece by piece. So they pay you, it's almost like a monthly income, uh, eventually they own it. But as long as you are alive, you can live in that place forever. So good well, idea. As long as yeah. you can live. If yeah, you, if I, from, I suppose if, if you, you live if you're long. from Rosetto, if you're from Rosetto, Pennsylvania, maybe. Yeah. Live long and prosper. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I don't know if it's a good idea or not. It's really relative to, um, uh, in some cases, there are people that do it. Um, they can sometimes be a little bit concerned, more or less the children, perhaps a bit more concerned, knowing that they're not going to be inheriting the house. 
but I think ultimately it's up to the, the owner of the home and the parents in this case to make that decision because it's their life that I think they have to be putting on that oxygen mask on themselves first and, and making sure that they're okay. And I, I like the idea of filial piety too. It's, we, we do live in a world where a lot of younger people have got their hands out to their parents. Whereas historically, the people that would be working, the children that would be working would actually be helping the parents. And I like that idea. I think, I think, that's, I think that's good. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when we look at what socialized, socialized programs basically do that anyway through taxes. You know, so we, but back in the day before we had these things, it was family and it was friends that would help each other. And we you know back to those whole points that we were talking about earlier, it's that pro-social giving and that pro-social helping that actually feels awesome. Paying taxes doesn't. Even though your taxes go towards many of the same things, it's faceless. You know, you don't see where it's going. You don't see how it's allocated or how efficiently it's allocated. And you don't necessarily see who you're helping when you're paying your taxes either. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like that idea of, of, of younger people being responsible with their money and seeing if they, can, if they can help their parents if they need it. Yeah, I didn't mean to encourage uh, people be you know disinheriting their children or anything, but so, um, <laughs> that's not what I'm advocating. But uh, yeah, you you brought up a really good point, and I suppose this is something we could talk a lot more about. But you know, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But it's about the uh, you know, and and we see this still in in a lot of countries like India, especially in China mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. that, you know, when you're young, the parents they support you, and because they don't have such a you know pension right. system you know when they get older the the children look after the parents that's traditionally yeah. Yeah. the way things were but, that's right uh, yeah and that was the traditional way of doing things now so um i just want to mention andrew's books again so uh balance how to invest and spend for happiness so this is not just about you know the financials about health and uh, you know well-being and you know work-life balance would that be Fair to say, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, and the second book is a uh, millionaire expat: how to build wealth living overseas. Uh, that's about you know retirement, investing, taking advantage of uh, you know local taxation and uh, you know um, arbitrage, as you say. The yeah, what's, what's the phrase? Arbitrage. Uh, yeah. Geographical arbitrage. Geographical arbitrage. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and your book also, which is uh, the Nine Rules of Wealth Teacher. So I think this is uh, not just for yeah, it's it's teaching you to be wealthy, but it's also for teachers as well because that's your your background, isn't it? Yeah, I was a teacher, so the the publisher decided let's call this book Millionaire Teacher. Maybe cringe a little bit the title, but. Um, but it ended up doing pretty well, so I think people like that title. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's uh, when I used to work in sales job, and I, I heard the people that were more successful than I was, uh, they were the cheesy salespeople, you know. <laughs> and they say, you know, cheese works. So there you go. There's uh, I don't know. Yeah. That's a takeaway for somebody. So yeah, you might cringe at the title, but you know, it's done done well for you, hasn't it? On on Amazon. Yeah, it's, yeah, it has. Um, so uh, Andrew's books are available all the usual places and his uh, I'll put a link in the description andrewhallam.com and Andrew you also have a Facebook group that's uh, actually I'll just give a shout out to Nick Nick Jaworski who I interviewed um, uh, a few weeks back and he he mentioned you and you know should get in contact and uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, your Facebook group it's a uh, it's a group for expats who want to know how to best invest their money so they can ask each other's each other questions. So it's a uh, expats and international teachers Facebook group. Okay, expat, and I'll put a link also in the show notes as well. And uh, I think they go into a lot of specifics and details there, and it breaks down you know individual cases. I I think, and probably if you want to use the search function, you can or you know, start to uh, start your own post. And I think there's about almost 10,000 is there in, in that group? Yes. Yes. That's a big group. It's grown quite a bit. 
Great. So uh, we're going to wrap things up in a little bit. I have an, uh, I have another podcast to record after this. But Andrew, uh, if people want to get in contact, work with you, um, what's the best way? Go through your website or Twitter? Yeah, they could do LinkedIn. that. Uh, link, LinkedIn is probably, probably one of the easier ones. LinkedIn, uh, andrewhallen.com. There's uh, an email address that's there associated with people that want me to give give talks at international schools and corporations or make bulk orders for boxes of books. Yeah, exactly. Bulk orders here, please, uh, from Andrew. So, um, Andrew, what's the plan? Are you planning another book or course, website? What's uh, what's next on the agenda? <laughs> uh, I think we are planning just to enjoy Panama and uh, – We'll spend some time in the south of France this summer. And so we'll stay here until about May and then head to France and enjoy that. And then we'll see from there. We'll see. We're very globally nomadic and we're enjoying it. Great. And uh, Andrew Hallam, thank you again. My pleasure, Philip. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out EFLmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.